minister to you and thank you for the invitation for Eddie and I to, to join you know I got a feeling I'm on a trip over that yeah. <laughs> all right there we go well let's get started if you would put aside your knowledge of what you know about God for just a moment that you've derived from the study of Scripture, would you imagine with me, who, who, how would you imagine God to be if you didn't have Scripture to shape that? Who, who would He be? How would you construct Him? A couple of weeks ago we looked at the Trinity. Uh, I'm not certain I would think of that concept for sure. I wouldn't describe that. That's too complicated. If I were to imagine a God, he'd have to be somebody I could understand. And the Trinity, though it's a truth, uh, I don't quite understand it completely. So that would not be one of his attributes. So anything under, un, understandable, I would eliminate. The next thing I'd eliminate regarding God are things that character traits that I don't really admire and that I'm concerned about. I, I'd want just traits that I am very fond of. Well, fortunately we have scripture to guide us as to what uh, and who God is. Last week we looked at the first and second commandments and it ended by a rather strange statement in Exodus 20 verse 5. It says that God is a jealous God. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Perhaps you're thinking that this is kind of heavy. Perhaps you're thinking, man, that's kind of a negative subject. But it's not. I'd like to suggest to you that that's a real positive subject to look at regarding God. It is a dimension of His love. And therefore, it is, it, it is, it is a, a character trait that's very admirable. We're going to be looking at it this morning. To know God as He really is means then that we struggle with issues such as the word jealous. The reason why we're hesitant to embrace, embrace a God who has that characteristic is because our jealousy is not always pure. It's not a virtue, is it? And therefore, when we think of a jealous God, we immediately associate the sinful jealousy that we experience and we transfer it to Him. Not so. We're going to look at it and see that it is a positive trait of our Lord. A.W. Tozer once wrote, no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. And he said, he believed that we tend to resemble our idea of God. We resemble our idea of God. And he said, worship is pure or base as a worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. And so that's a good reason to study this attribute. And we're going to complete that sentence. I should have put a couple of periods after it. My name is because Scripture indicates to us something unique about God. It teaches us His exclusivity, that He is a jealous God. It's a theme that runs throughout Scripture, including the New Testament. And it also says in Scripture that my name he calls himself by name. So we could complete that sentence by saying, My name is Jealous. For we see that title given to him in, in uh, not title, uh, the name given to him in Exodus 34, verse 14. Uh, the Ten Commandments were given previous to that. And then we see that... Um, Later on in the 34th chapter, he's giving instructions to the Israelites on how they're to possess the land. And he makes a statement. And I think I have that on the screen. Do not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. <laughs> 
he ascribes that as his name. Isn't that interesting? What's in a name anyway? That's a question that Shakespeare asked, didn't he? And we would have to answer that a name is very important part of a person, isn't it? You know, parents consider uh, carefully and they struggle over the selection of a name for a child. I know Addie and I did that, and I'm sure if you're a parent, you struggled over a, just the right name for your child. Well, uh, a name is, is more than a, a label of identification. Studies have shown that uh, peers will treat a child according to the name at times. And a parent will select a name because of its sound or its popularity, more than the meaning of the name. A matter of fact, if the name has any meaning today, we, we just perhaps uh, simply smile at that characteristics. But it wasn't too long ago that names were very, very important. Uh, Anglo-Saxon names oftentimes had had special meaning. They indicated occupations. Uh, Smith, Miller, Carpenter. They also expressed, name would express the origination. My name is Van Den Berg from the Berg Mountain or Hill. So it indicated where you were from as well. Your name more than likely has some significance in that realm as well. Well, in biblical times, to have a name was of utmost importance. It donated or de donated some, some, some history or some characteristic about you. And in Scripture, we see that God has various names, numerous names. Why so many? Why so many names? Well, the reason is that while a name can be very descriptive, it is also restrictive. When you think about it, a name or a title has a self-imposed limitation and none can begin to really describe God in its entirety. And in, in a sense, he is an unnameable one. His glory and his greatness defy any one description. And therefore, the best way to know and understand God is to, portray, to perceive it as a portrait uh, put together and that it's a mosaic of names and titles. You look at the mosaic to see his totality. Each, each name and each title refers to a unique aspect of that person and such it is with the title and name of Jesus or of Jealous. It, 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 it adds a dimension to God that we don't always stop and think of. And I'd like to suggest to you that his jealousy is rooted in his great love. It is a dimension of his love towards us. And because he calls himself by the name Jealous, it gives us a second reason to study and grapple with what it means to have a jealous God. So let's begin. Let's begin to look at his exclusivity. This building is a rather unique building. Uh, my wife, incidentally, always uh, overlooks my slides, and rightly so. She looked at the way I spelt that, and she said, "You got that spell wrong. It's uh, Partheon." And so I thought, well, maybe I do. And I went back on the internet and looked, and actually there's a Greek par Parthia, Partheon, and it is a temple to Zeus, and it's in a different city. This particular building was built in Rome. And it's rather unique. It's built in a circle. The backside you can see is circular. You see, the God of the Old Testament is exclusive, but the gods, plural, of the ancient Near East we're tolerant of one another. And the tolerance can be seen in this building. The Roman, Romans designed this ingeniously. They built it in a circle so that all the gods could be in the perimeter of the circle and the, in the center was the altar. So every god was an equal distance from the altar. Our god would never tolerate that. Never. 
Never would he tolerate that. A matter of fact, just in the presence of his name, it was so exclusive and so powerful when the Ark of the Covenant was placed in a temple with a foreign god, Dagon, the next morning, Dagon was found flat on his face. This is a rather humorous passage. It has some biting humor into it. See, let me give you a little history of this passage. Uh, as you know, Eli's son went out to battle, and when they went out to battle, they were not, uh, they were not following the Lord, so to speak. But they decided to take the ark out with them. That would be the way to win the battle. And instead, the battle was lost and the ark was taken into possession. And uh, the enemy carried it uh, to their city and put it inside Dagon's temple. And what happened? <laughs> the next morning, he was laid flat on his face, head down into the dirt. Verse 3 is somewhat of an entertaining verse to me. It says, they took Dagon and put him back in his place. What kind of God is that? What takes human hands to put you back into place? But they put him back into place. And then the next day, the same event occurred. Only this time, his head and hands were severed. War is brutal, it is today as well as then, and back then, oftentimes, hands and heads were severed as trophies for victory. And here was their god, Dagon, laying on the ground with heads and hands severed. It was an expression of total defeat. Our god is an exclusive god. He is God and will not occupy the same temple as someone else. Another interesting verse is that fifth verse. It, it said that the priest, every time they entered the temple, they stepped over the threshold because Dagon was found the second day with his head down on the, on the threshold. And so every time they came up to worship their God, they'd make sure they stepped over the threshold. That's like acknowledging, my God's inferior, but I'm going to step over the threshold anyway to worship him. The story goes on, and verse 6, it tells us that God's hand was heavy upon the people of Ashdod, who... Uh, captured this God. And we see as the, just to complete this story, allow me to do that, uh, they had uh, tumors begin to develop and it was thought that a plague uh, spread by uh, rats invested, infested their city and they were so concerned that eventually they, they thought, well, they were confused. So they took uh, the Ark of the Covenant and they moved it to a second city. And it occurred at the second city. And they thought, well, let's move it to a third city. And the third city said, no, we don't want it. Let's return it. And so they decided to return it, but they thought that they should offer an offering to do so. And so they made golden... Uh, tumors and golden rats and built a cart and sent it back. And, and they were still uncertain whether they wanted to return this because it was a valuable, a valuable golden laid uh, Ark of the Covenant. It was, it was very valuable. So they took cows that uh, had been separated from their calves and figuring that if, if, if this plague was not due to the Jehovah God, at least the cow would return back to its calves. But despite that, the cow made it, cows made a direct, uh, direct path back to Israel and, and the ark was returned. 
And so we see from this passage that God is an exclusive God, but we also see that he's a God that is motivated by his jealousy as well. There's a motivation connected with his jealousy. And that really is a third reason why to, to look at the concept of a jealous God. We find that his jealousy is, is constantly presented in Scripture as a motivation for an action. And we should have really uh, determined that from its initial presentation in the Ten Commandments in, in Exodus 20. For uh, it concluded by saying, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children uh, third and fourth generation, but showing love to a thousand generation. You see, it's, it's a motivation for correction, but it's also a motivation to show love. You know, when I read that, sometimes I get hung up in the first section where he shows wrath to the third and fourth generation, and I fail to grasp the second part where he shows mercy. The, the same God who calls himself jealous has this enormous love that he showed to thousands of generations. Not just four or five or three or four, but thousands of generations. And really, the history of, of mankind has been centered around the jealousy of God and his actions. Throughout scripture, you take the Old Testament and we see the Israelites as if they were a wayward child on many, many different occasions. And as a parent, if you have a wayward child, don't you have a great love for that child and have reason to correct that child? And so we see the, the Old Testament is just a, almost a continuous story of how God reacted out of jealousy to correct and to love both. And even our future is determined by that. It really is. If you read prophecy and study prophecy, uh, you'll see that it's his name, that his jealousy for his name, that motivates him. And I was reading the other day in Zech uh, uh, Zechariah 14, verse 9, it said, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord in his name, the only name. See, all of history is moving forward so that someday all will recognize him as the one and only Lord. A matter of fact, God has given unto his son a name amongst, above all names, hasn't he? That, that being Jesus. And someday, everyone will bow to him. So history is moving towards a realization that God is one and his name is to be glorified when he comes back a second time. So really, we have three reasons this morning to look at the concept of a jealous God. Uh, it, number one, it... it it, the view, our view of God affects our worship of him. And second, uh, he uses it as his name and therefore it epitomizes to some degree his personhood. And then the third reason is that throughout history, jealousy has been a motivated God uh, to shape and form history. So, let's come to grips with what it means to have a jealous God. It's hard to comprehend because it's so often seen as a vice in man. In man we see it expressed as, I want what you got and I hate you because I don't have it. That's not too flattering. If that was attributed to God, it would be a very, very sobering thought, wouldn't it? But it's not. That is a sinful expression that men find. And 
we see that envy and malice and meanness are expressed through this emotion of jealousy. And envy is common amongst men. So there must be a virtue to this jealousy or we couldn't describe it to God. That's not a description of God by any means. So there has to be a virtue to this quality. It must be a virtue if God possesses it. Well, unfortunate, or fortunately rather, there's another aspect of jealousy that even humans, that even humans will reflect on occasions. And it's not a vice, but rather it's a virtue. Let's look at that. This type of jealousy is a zeal to protect the love relationship. It's in the realm of a husband and wife relationship. And it's not a sinful reaction of wounded pride, but it's a positive indication of affection. There was a professor by the name of Tasker. Professor Tasker wrote in his commentary on James, and let me read it to you. Married persons who felt no jealousy at the intrusion of a lover or an adulterer into their home would surely be lacking in moral perception. For the exclusiveness of marriage is the essence of marriage. You see, that type of jealousy is a virtue. It's a virtue to, to want to keep your marriage intact and to keep it exclusive. It is legitimate in that realm. Certainly it can digress to sin, but if two people love each other, is it not natural for them to have and want to preserve that relationship? Of course it is. And it's that kind of trait that God possesses. As a matter of fact, in, numer in Numbers, rather, in the fifth chapter, Numbers, the fifth chapter, and perhaps I'm not following along on my screens. Ooh, yeah, marriage relationship, we talked about that. Uh, but in Numbers, the fifth chapter, there's an unusual aspect of the law, and it has to do with uh, husband and wife relationship again, where if one of the spouses felt the other party was guilty of, of uh, neglect in the relationship, that it's an interesting passage. You can read it at your leisure. It's, a, it's a, both an offering as well as taking some uh, bitter... Uh, it, it's, it's an unusual ritual that they went through, but it helped determine the innocent of the innocence of the, the accused person. The reason I bring this up though is verse 31 here. The husband will be innocent of any wrongdoing. The fact that he initiated this aspect of the law of wanting, he had a desire to preserve that relationship, that husband and wife relationship and it's legitimate even according to this particular passage of scripture of uh, portion of the law. God's jealousy then is portrayed in scripture as a trait that is a virtue. He wants your affections. He guards your affections. In the Old Testament, Israel is oftentimes referred to as being in marriage with God. That God's covenant is, is, is a marriage with Israel and oftentimes they'll use words when Israel was disobedient he would refer to them as an adulterous people even in the New Testament we see the same concept because the church is what the bride of Christ and so this marriage demands a response of love and loyalty on our behalf in return we see in Ezekiel 36, 38, it depicts Israel as an adulterous wife. But we find in the New Testament the same kind of language that God is exclusive and he wants, he wants our affections in return. We see in passages like 1 Corinthians 10, verse 22, which reads, Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? 
And then we see it in James 4, 5, where it says, Or do we think Scripture says without reason that the Spirit He caused to live in us envies intensely? So we see from verses like that in the New Testament as well, God is consistent with His name and both covenants. And He, he asks and he ask us to respond to Him with affection. Uh, God's jealousy over His people presupposes an enormous love that He has for us. He sent His Son, didn't He? Died on the cross for us. He loves us immensely. And His jealousy is the, a dimension of this love. He would like us to reciprocate. It's not an accident, his love. It's not an aimless love. It's a purposeful love. And so, we might ask of ourselves, what does God ask of us in return? What does God ask of us in return? What kind of behavior does he expect of us in response to his character? Well, it can be characterized with the word zeal. Have you ever seen a zealous person, somebody who's enthusiastic and positive? Well, that's what he expects of us as well in, in return. And we're going to look at a couple of New Testament passages that indicate what zeal is. And collectively, as a church, we're responsible for it. And the first passage that I selected indicates to us what zeal is not. It says, uh, it concludes by speaking to the church, and it says, Because you are lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold. That's a lack of zeal. And he's criticizing uh, this church be, because of a lack of zeal. Uh, lukewarmness is not an appropriate response to a loving God. It's neither hot nor cold. And we as individuals and collectively need to demonstrate rather a zeal. If we go to 2 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, we begin to get more descriptive ideas as to what zeal actually means. Uh, the Corinthians had been criticized uh, for their lack of zeal. And he responds and says, see what this godly sorrow has produced in you. Earnestness, eagerness, indignation, alarm, concern, readiness to see justice. These are characteristics of zeal and an appropriate response to a, to a loving God. Then we see in James, where in the fourth chapter, the fourth verse, uh, those that were the recipients of this book, uh, James writes, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Uh, Again, we see a phrase, what zeal is not, it's not a friendship with the world. It's not a worldliness, uh, not a hatred. Uh, it's likened unto a hatred towards God. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And then we see in the verses that follow this, Again, some descriptive terms of what it would be to be zealous for the Lord. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil. Come near to God. Grieve and humble yourselves are characteristics of a repentant person who had not been zealous for the Lord. These are characteristics that he would respond and he would like us to respond rather. Zeal then in religion is a burning desire to please God. A zealous man out of necessity is a man of one thing, of exclusive devotion to God. Our God has got an exclusive love for you. He has a passionate love for you. And man's 
apostasy or defection then becomes very unbearable to him. It's the same as with adultery amongst humans. It's the spurning of one's partner's deepest commitment. He wants our love and devotion reciprocated. I'd like to conclude with a story that Max Licato talks about in one of his books. Let me get the screen changed. It's just a picture. Would you like to move it forward? There are pearls. It's a story entitled Pearls. But it describes what God asks of us, I think. He tells the story of a six-year-old. Her name was Susie. And Susie's favorite possessions was a string of fake pearls. The fact that they were fake didn't really bother her. Uh, she wore them everywhere and played with them daily. She loved her pearls. She also loved her daddy. His business oftentimes took him away for days at a time, and the first day home would be one of great celebration. As an adult, she still remembered the time when he spent uh, a week in the Orient, and when he returned, they played all afternoon when he arrived home. When her dad put her to bed that evening, he asked this question, Do you love me? Susie replied, Yes, Daddy, I love you more than anything. More than anything? Her dad asked. More than anything, she replied. He paused for a moment. More than your pearls? Would you give me your pearls? Oh, Daddy, she replied, I can't do that. I love my pearls. I understand, her dad said. Kissed her goodnight and left the room. As she fell asleep that night, she thought about that request. And when she awoke, she thought about it some more. And throughout the day, she thought about that request. And finally that evening, finally that evening, she went to her dad with her pearls and said, Daddy, I love you more than these. You may have them. I'm so glad to hear that, he replied. And he stood up and opened his attache case and he brung forth a gift. He said, I, I brought you back a gift. And she opened the small flat box and she gasped. It was filled with real pearls. God has an enormous love for you. And he'll give you the best if you don't cling to those imitation pearls. Imitation, imitation pearls will keep us from God's best. We need to surrender that which hinders our love towards him. What are your imitation pearls? And how important are they to you? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you're a God that loves us. And you love us so much you want to protect that relationship. May we have that same kind of zeal of wanting to protect our thoughts and our inclinations so that we might continue to love us, or love you rather, in an appropriate manner. We praise you in the name of Christ. Amen.